Okay, this evening I'm joined by uh, Brian McKenna. Brian is a Dubliner from Palmerstown in Dublin, and he played for Harps in the 98-99 season and the 99-2000 season. Brian made 67 appearances for the club in those two seasons, which is quite a high uh, amount for a goalkeeper. And interestingly, I know I always give goal scorers, and as a just a turn, Brian kept 16 clean sheets in his first season, and he kept four clean sheets in his second season. Uh, Brian, great to have you on. Thank you, Barry. It was nice to get the invitation. Not at all. Um, we we kind of go straight into it, Brian. You had uh, uh, you kind of you, you played with Home Farm in their academy sides, and Home Farm were well known for getting players away to England. And you did. You were fortunate enough that uh, a club in England came across for you. How was that experience for you? Oh, it was brilliant. It, like. I left school, did me leaving cert, went to Brighton when I was 17. Basically, it was in the first team squad. We had three goalkeepers. Um, for, unfortunately, the first year, uh, my first reserve team game, I damaged my groin. And unfortunately, I was just carrying that the whole until December, came home to Ireland <clears throat> for a month, and then uh, um, went back, and it was still the same. So then I went up to see... Uh, Gilmore up in uh, Harley Street and he operated on me and I was back playing football six weeks later so my first year was a disaster really as an injury and then the second year I came back I was basically number two and Perry Digby got player of the year that year so that was the end of it unfortunately came back uh, very lucky to go out to UCD uh, Dr Tony O'Neill was there and I knew Theo Dunn personally I'm very good friends with his, his son Thomas and uh, I signed for UCD, so that got me back playing in the League of Ireland. But in England, it was it, it's a great experience, and you'd never t- you can't turn it down. Um, a bit different than ne- like nowadays is a, a little bit different. Like re- you really trained in the morning, and that was it. Away you went, and you know you did your bit in the gym in the afternoon, play a reserve game on a Wednesday night, travel with the force team on a Saturday. You know that was your usual schedule, really, as a young professional. So you didn't have sort of the experience that they have now, you know, where they have to keep up with their schooling and everything. Though, of course, you had said that you'd finished your own leaving cert at that stage anyway. So you had yeah, that but, to fall back he, on. Yeah, well, there's a huge Irish contingent when we when I went over. Derek McGrath was over there. Paul McCarthy was over there. Greg O'Dowd. And there was Maxie McCann. There was a good Irish, Dave Savage. I think he ended up playing for Millwall. He was there as well. But even when that, they were there, there was no such thing as school. And it was, you were doing your training and then um, did your jobs and then you went home. Mm-hmm. So, but the year we got let go, like I think 20 people got let go that year. You know, Brighton were losing 20,000 sterling a, a, a week, I think it was at the time. Oh my um, they sold the, yeah, they sold the ground to Tesco. And they actually went over a good few years later and there was a big Tesco on the old Goldstone ground. So <laughs> that was, they were that that was dumb shock. <laughs> well, you know, that you know, they used to talk about the slope in Oxford. There was a slope in the Goldstone ground as well. <laughs> it was it wasn't as bad, but it, it was there. Um and then they obviously moved up to the Whitdean Stadium where we used to do pre-season training, uh, running around there. Um and then we moved up to the university for our training ground, which was the most it was the windiest place in the world I've ever seen for training. <laughs> it was hard to do any proper training up there. But anyway, the facilities were good, you know. Brilliant. And um, you came back to UCD. You did You did quite well at UCD. I think you um, you certainly won the Shields um, in your time yes. at UCD. Um, then you moved on again. Um, you went to Limerick. Yes. You had a spell in Monaghan. And... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you came back the, to go on, sorry, Brian. No, no, the 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 UC thing I was so lucky and I, I and I thanked Tony O'Neill for it because um I just went out training with them. I I was at a loose end. I had done a bit of training with Dermot Keeley at Sligo Rovers and he was staying with Nicky Brujo and I had nothing to do. And Theo said, Come out and train, at least just come out and train. 
and went out and trained and training went very well. And then the doc said to me, would you be interested in signing whatever? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I had two great years there. And of course, the facilities out there, the fitness wise, it was just a great setup to be involved in. And then obviously time to move on. I got a move to Limerick. And I have to be honest, uh, Billy Canam was in charge then. Um, and Noel Hanley was the secretary. He looked after me really, really well. Really, first year was great. It's the first time and the only time I got player of the year <laughs> uh, down there. Got supporters of the, uh, the uh, player of the year, which was brilliant. We got to the semifinals of the cup. Uh, got beaten by Sligo in Sligo 1-0. And uh, yeah, it was it was a difficult. We when we went there, we were str- they were struggling really. Um, and uh, we got it to the last game of the season with a chance of staying up. Um, now that was the time of the top six and the bottom six type of stuff yeah. and actually St. Pat's were in the bottom six um, with us but uh, unfortunately we went down that year and the next year um, Noel King came in and changed things around and we had a chance of getting in the playoffs just missed out and then we had we had problems contractual problems and eventually I was very lucky I met Billy Baxter, I used to work for Ballygown and I was on Grafton Street and Billy said to me, uh, Brian, what's the story with you? You're not you're not playing. And I said, no, I said, I'm only after getting released from um, from Limerick. It took six months to get released. Um, so he said, will you come up and play for Monaghan? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I, I got a couple of months up in Monaghan, just to get back playing again. And then I moved to St. Pat's. Um, so yeah, it's strange way things work out, but you know their experience as a football. Yeah, no, I suppose in in a sense it, it shows you had a uh, willingness to travel if if you weren't getting your your first team game anywhere else, you know. Um, what was it like playing under Billy Baxter? He was a great character, or sorry, he still is a great character. Yeah, yeah. Well, Billy actually lives up the road uh, from me. I, I well, he did at the time. I don't know if he's still up there, but um, Billy, I pick up Billy. In the car, I mean, we travel up um, some of the times, and I know my mom the night on Monday morning. My mom said, "Who was smoking cigarettes in the car?" Because <laughs> Billy used to smoke those uh, Jeanettes. I think they were a French oh, non-filter G-tons. cigarette. G-tons. It was oh, yes, G-tons, G-tons. yes. Oh, this, we all had the windows down driving up in the car, <laughs> you know. And uh, but Billy was very calm in the dressing room. He, he, let, he let a lot of senior players get involved like John Tracy Trapper was playing there at the time I was there uh, there was a few there was a few senior bodies around uh, with some inexperienced players at the time but yeah it was very enjoyable B- B- Billy knew all the players in the league he'd, you'd, you'd always find them at training grounds and things like that and um, then t- I think Tommy Connolly was his assistant he used to do all the coaching and whatever and then Billy got let go then near the end of the season so Tommy took over then as well and uh, yeah, it was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And then, as you say, you went to St. Pat's. Um, would it be safe to say that was probably the best time of your career in the League of Ireland? Um, you won two league medals. Um, and then I think Trevor Wood got brought in the following year. Um, uh, it was a little bit actually the, the other way around. The first year, Brian Kerr was in charge. Brian signed me for St. Pat's and we... He, he brought in a good few players that year um, after the win the league. And I think Davy Campbell went on to Shelbourne or whatever. So there was a few new bodies came in that that current year. And then Brian left at Christmas right. to take over the the youths. So Pat Dolan took over. And um, so Pat, Pat was very good to me. Again, you know, he came over. I want you to be number one and all that type of stuff. So that was second half of the season. Would have played a good good few games. And then Trevor Wood would have came in then the start of the, that's the next season. Yes. So Trevor got in the team and obviously he had that fantastic game against Celtic and all that in the Champions League qualifier and all that. So I was just reserved to Trevor and um, they won the leagues obviously with a very good team, a massive squad we had as well. But um, then I remember I was finished training one night and Pat Dolan says to me, um, Charlie McKeever has been on from Finn Harps. He wants to speak to you. I said, all right, okay. And I, I, he was happy enough to let me go and speak to them. So uh, done the deal with Charlie and met Derek Wilkinson, of course. And, um, you know, signed a contract. And the, I always liked Charlie because 
Charlie always in our team talks about it was the back five. It wasn't just the goalkeeper and the back five. It was the back five. He always spoke as a unit about us, which was always good. Um, because sometimes in, in other teams, people didn't speak like that, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's how I ended up in Harps. And um, I have to be honest with you, I think that was a more enjoyable time. Well, as I said to you at the start there, you made 67 appearances in the two seasons. Yeah. So you were pretty much a regular. I think we'd, we'd, we'd had Dave Henderson. Oh, no, sorry. Stephen Henderson had been our keeper. Yes. Um, And Charlie brought you in then. I think Stephen, he, he was moving down towards the Cove area at that stage. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, So, like, you know, and then as you say, as a, as a unit, you're back five, like 16 clean sheets in your first season. We finished fourth in the league, just outside mm. the European places. And, of course, we got to that unforgettable cup final. Uh, or shall we say... The trilogy. Three cup, the trilogy. Three cup finals in, in 1999. <laughs> um, it must have enjoyed, you know, that season in particular must have been very enjoyable for you. Were you training with Harps at that stage or did you train in Dublin and just go up for the matches? Yeah, most of the time, yeah, I trained in Dublin. Um, either by myself or at that time uh, I was tra- doing a bit of training at St. Pat's still Yes. so I was training with Pat's maybe on a Tuesday night down the ground at Trevor Wood and whatever we do our goalkeeping work do a bit of work myself um, go to the gym and then the Friday nights if we were at home uh, I would, I'd would set off from work on Friday and meet Charlie up at, uh, up at the ground and he'd smash a few balls with me with his lovely left peg <laughs> And uh, then you know, have a bite to eat, stay over, and then obviously meet up with the team the next day. So that was that was uh, regular enough uh, the, going up on a Friday, um, which I thought, you know, it was nice to get up and do a bit of work on a Friday and then uh, be ready for the game on a Saturday. Did, um, the, um, did the traveling ever bother you? Like, I mean, it was, you know, as you say, you, you had a full time job. So you were you were hopping in a car on a Friday night or maybe sometimes on a Saturday morning, depending on your circumstances. Yeah. Um, did that never come into play for you though? I suppose like you'd already played with Limerick as well and stuff like that. So yeah. Well, the Lim- the Limerick was was a train. You'd meet like to be Stephen Craig and to be Ray Duffy, Niall Kyo and Sean Reardon. We'd all meet at the train to go to Limerick. And with it's funny with with when I was going up anyway, I was given a phone number of Peter Forlong. Yes. I don't know if you know Peter. Yeah. Oh, I do know. And Peter, Peter was yeah. The, yeah. And Peter, in the first time I rang Peter, how you doing, Brian McKenna here? He says, how are you doing? He says, I'll drive up tomorrow. I says, Grant, I says, where will I meet you? Oh, the roundabout. At the time, the roundabout uh, over the M50 in Palmerstown. So I walked up there and this red Daihatsu charade pulled in <laughs> and I just hoped it was <laughs> Peter Furlong. So anyway, there was myself and Peter then for a good while going up uh, in the in the car. We'd stop off in uh, Casa Blaney and go into juniors and, oh, juniors. you know, maybe get a bite to eat. Yeah. yeah, and then uh, drive on then up to the ground and probably meet in one of the pubs across the road for a bit of pre-match. Um, and then I think Fergal Harkin then, he signed then. So there was some, sometimes Fergal was with us and sometimes he went up on the Friday. And uh, so, yeah, Peter Furlong used to do a lot of the driving and fairness to the man. That was his contribution, he said, to the club. No, he's, um, he's still he's still going anyway. He's still, well. Oh, good. I, think, I don't think he's doing all the driving anymore, Brian. But yeah, uh, he's still, right. He's still su- supporting the team, and uh, you, you know, yeah. before the pandemic, you would have often seen him at games. Uh, he brings yeah. he brings his young son to the matches as well. Oh, brilliant! And then the odd time, then we had Derek Wilkinson, where you were given the keys to drive. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I I'd well believe that I've. I, Few journeys with Derek myself, yes. And the the time we had to play Cork in the replay on the Tuesday in Finn Park, yes. we drew drew with them in Turner's Cross in the cup run. I think the game was turned around on the Tuesday. Derek uh, met me. Uh, we we met out one of the pubs out on the North Road, and he had a friend with him. I think he might have been a priest. So obviously we won the game, and we're on the way back, and. Derek and his friend announced that they needed to go to the toilet. Um, I think we were still in the north at this stage and we came across this pub on the left-hand side. 
he says, pull in here, Brian, we go into the toilet. So I'm sitting outside in a lovely scouted car and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I said, Jesus, I better go in and see if they're all right. <laughs> <laughs> and there they are having a few sups. Yes, yes. a pint and a, and a and a short yeah and then of course the two of them got back in the car and both of them fell asleep I woke them up when we pulled in to pick up my car on the way but uh, oh, yeah great times great time but when you were travelling like that when you, you know usually you get home one o'clock in the morning or whatever yeah sometimes you stopped sometimes Peter would say listen we're going to keep going and then other times say listen lads I need a break and either way you go into juniors and You'd have a bag of chips and you'd have a lemonade or whatever and then head on home then as well. But the traveling never bothered me. It actually, the country football probably suited me job a little bit better. There was less pressure, if you know what I mean, because the games were on the weekend and whatever. And the Dublin teams, you could be going to the gym and you could be going to the match and all that type of stuff. Yeah. So it never really bothered me, to be honest. And we, we, we'll bring you to the cup final of 1999. First game. You get man on the yeah. match. Yeah. But it wasn't a particularly good game, and I don't think we turned up that much on the day. So I think you probably had more to do in that game than you probably did in the other two. Well, <laughs> I had to make a save from my own man. Speaky decided to head one towards our goal. <laughs> but, it, yeah, I always felt, and I, and I had said it after the game, I got interviewed after the game, obviously, and they said to me about, you know, the game, whatever. And it's... We always knew how Bray would play. They'd yeah. play five at the back. Like, you know, it wasn't three and it was five and they kept it tight and all that. And it was for us to break them down. And that was going to be a hard thing if the five of them stayed in, in the... But yeah, you're right. The first game, we we didn't turn up. And I think we, you know, second game, played a lot better. Again, penalty save and all that type of stuff. And your man was in the box when the save was made. and. I, yeah. I, I was oh. actually looking at the footage of it recently. Um, we, we, we had a 50th year, Harps were 50 years in the league there a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I actually had to look at the footage for the first time. And it was amazing how the feeling of loss came back to me. Um, yeah. You know, this was to be our way, never mind getting to Europe through the league. We, we were going to get into Europe this way and we we're going to win a trophy. And yeah. I, I still, and then I, I saw the bloody footage and I looked at it. And when you see Tresson going to kick the ball, Tarzan yeah. was nearly on his tail. And I remember yeah. I, I was in the main stand at Talca that day and I was jumping up and down going, he saved it, he saved it. Yeah. But of course, yeah. Tarzan was following yeah. him, put it in the back of the net. When it all finished, like the, obviously the whistle just blew after that because... Uh, I kept saying to myself, how did he get there so quickly? I couldn't understand how, how Tarzan could get there so quickly. And I remember walking off and there was an, a friend of mine, uh, Aaron Lynch, who, who was at Bray at the time, goes, hard luck, he says, but it shouldn't have been it shouldn't have been a goal. And it was only when when we seen it on the telly that night how far ahead of it was. Now, we met up then, I think the replay then was the Thursday night maybe? It was uh, Sunday, Sunday, Saturday, and thir- yeah, it was Thursday. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. And like, yeah, the, the old meeting on Thursday at the hotel wasn't the most wasn't the most pleasant meeting because they showed the penalty being taken. And I remember Gavin Dykes; he had his arms wrapped around. <laughs> I don't know who he was marking, but he wasn't going anywhere. And uh, there was a few choice words anyway, you know, about you know people switching off and all that type of stuff. And unfortunately. We lost then the third game. And I always feel that, you know, that was a great stepping stone. If he had won that, it would have been a great stepping stone for the club because I think it would have rewarded, you know, what people invested in the team and how and how things went. And when we went back for training, the, 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 you know, later on the summer, it was a bit flat and it was a bit down. Um, a bit of a hangover probably from it. And obviously then we got off to a bad start then as well that 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 next season. Yeah, no, we well, I was going to go into that as well. Like, I mean, mm. we obviously had a dreadful start, and I think Charlie he resigned after something like seven or eight games. And uh, yeah. Gavin came in, you know. I mean, how, yeah. how did you feel at that stage? Like, you know, you, you come to Charlie had been there for about four or five years, so it was a fairly settled operation, as you say. Yeah. You know, we could have taken the club to the next level had we won the cup. Um, yeah. But all of a sudden now, you, you know, you were at a place where there was going to be a little bit of instability. Did that ever worry you or 
you know, were you just happy to, to, to carry on and see where it took you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, see, Gavin was a big voice in the in dressing room anyway. Yeah. You know, Charlie spoke and also Gavin then always gave us his, his opinion, whether it be before the game, during the game or after the game. He was a big, you now we had some big players in the, in the dressing room as well. Jonathan Speak was in there. Donald O'Brien was there for that, that first year. I was there. I don't think, I don't know what happened in the second year if he went off. No, I think he went off. Um, the yeah, year all he went to. Yeah, I think he went to play in the Irish League, or he got a an offer in the Irish League. And generally, the team was fairly settled. Even when we went back, I just felt that we were just we were just weren't at it, to be honest, Barry. And and I think it was a hangover. I really do. Um, my own my own self was. Uh, I felt a bit flat. I'll be honest. Um, because it was really a good opportunity. I think. Um, and I didn't know at the time myself, but my fitness was starting to slip. And then I, I, I lost my place in the team. Then I think young Gavin Cullen yeah. came into the yeah. team, did well. Yeah. And I was struggling. And then Dundalk came in for me to, to go to Dundalk. And I had a year at Dundalk and we won the first division that year. But physically, I was I was really struggling. I only played 20 games or whatever. And then the following year, I had a pacemaker put in. All right. Um, yeah. So I didn't know it at the time, but as I went into that that second season with Harps, I was struggling. And I didn't know why. And then I went to Dundalk and I struggled to train properly. You know, I was struggling to to, to get do my work and all that type of stuff. And I play one game and play great, and then the next game, geez, I wouldn't be anywhere near it. Yeah. And the following year, then um, I was meant to go back to Dundalk, and I just couldn't. I, I, I had no energy. And uh, I had a pacemaker put in then. So I retired when I was 30. My goodness. I, I always wonder why you retired so young. Uh, yeah. In that sense, because, I mean, and particularly for a goalkeeper, because uh, like goalkeepers seem to go on longer than outfield players for some reason, whether it's the wear yeah. on the body is not as, as hard and whatever, you know. I think as a goalkeeper, like, you get cute as well, though. You start to, you know... I felt I was getting, you know, really confident in myself, re, you know, knew what training to do, knew how to look after myself, you know, the things I needed to do. Yeah. I was feeling all that as I was getting older. And I think that's what happens. And you get and, and you, you find out what works for you. And I think maybe, you know, unfortunately, it all came to a, a halt very quickly. <laughs> unfortunately, very unfortunately. Yeah. And what did you do then to, to, to kind of fill your time up? I mean, you didn't just sort of say, right, obviously, once you got the pacemaker fitted and you got yourself back to some level yeah. of fitness, I mean, you never thought about going into coaching or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I have done coaching as in goalkeepers. Somebody would come up in the local team and say, would you come down and coach the goalkeepers and that? And I, yeah, absolutely. I've always sort of been open to it. But then... I went into work then. Uh, I was full time. I changed my job as well at the time, and I went into retail, which you know yourself is is you know I get Wednesday off during the week, and I work every Saturday th type of thing. So the flexibility then wasn't there in the job that I was doing. So um, like my daughter is, is 13 now, and she's playing for the local GEA team, and she wants to play and go. So we go down and do a bit of work with her. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And then of course. When you when you start training with ourselves, we do a half an hour or so before the rest of the team come down, and then you've got the coordinator in the GA club going. If I got a few other goalkeepers down, would you do a bit of work with them? <laughs> and then suddenly, so, suddenly it's like yeah, the six or seven of them there, so it's enjoyable. But I, I just don't I don't know. Bar I just walked away from it a little bit. You know what I mean? I sort of said, oh, you know. I'm, I walked away from where my mates and all, they all went into getting their coaching badges and were involved, like say Tommy Dunn and all, like managing in Cork and Galway. Like, you know, they just, they stuck with it when they stopped. I just, I just walked away from it. I play a bit of golf and, um, you know, I'm at home with the kids. Uh, when Hazel was one, I, 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 le I left my job and came home to mind them and my wife works full time. So now I work a bit of part time at Gorks Golf in Leopardstown. And then like, Training starts tonight. Dylan's training tomorrow night. Hazel's training Wednesday night. He's training Thursday night. She's training Saturday morning, and he's training Sunday morning. 
So where's the time, Bartley? You yeah, know what I mean? No, I, I, I know exactly where you're coming from. I have three, three kids as well. Thankfully, they're yeah. they're all old enough now. But like I remember yeah. running out and I, I coached teams for them and all of that thing. So I know exactly where you're coming from. And you yeah. suddenly realize, Jesus, you know, I don't have a minute here to myself. Uh, yeah. But well, you can we, change we, it either. Yeah, no. Oh, geez, no, no, absolutely. Like myself and Suzanne, the joke, but lock the door on Friday night and don't let anyone in. <laughs> <laughs> pull down the blinds because friday friday is just a, is our night where we're at home and you know that's our night to relax and then we'd be going again in the morning but uh yeah no listen it, it, I'm, I'm disappointed i would have you know love to continue playing on uh at the time but it just it just didn't happen unfortunately and it ended sharpishly um some people get a chance to say goodbye and yeah. say all this but th- that didn't happen so i'm on me i'm on me tour pacemaker now i got uh my tour one fitted there about two years ago so th- it's working great thank god oh that's great to hear i mean yeah in some ways you know it, it's great that you you managed to find out what was wrong with you as well um before it became yeah. too late um you know i mean it would be dreadful to, to, to think that you wouldn't have experienced what you have since you got the first pacemaker fitted you know well yeah it's it's funny um you come home from work, you have your dinner, and you would be getting some little chest pains, like you know. Uh, but you think it was indigestion, things like that. And then I went to see the the local doctor. Now, my mom has a pacemaker. She got hers when she was about fifty, fifty five. Now, the doctor says it's not hereditary. It's yeah. just why was the like I've I've two older sisters. They're fine, and I've a younger brother. And you're the only one that played sports. So why is why do you think it's a registry? You, you'd all have it if that was the case. But, it, you know, we all got tested when my mom got her pacemaker in and my heartbeat was about 42 beats a minute. And then um, I, I went down to get wisdom teeth. When I was at Finn Harps, I had to get my wisdom teeth out down in Mullingar. And I went to see the specialist and he said, yeah, we'll take them out in Mullingar on Monday. I says, oh, great. So he took them out anyway, and uh, he came in to talk to me after. He said, you have some heartbeat, he said. <laughs> I says, really? Yeah, he said, oh, it's lovely and slow. <laughs> and I said, all right. And he says to me, uh, I brought in my mate. My mate was in operating next door. I said, come in here and listen to your man's heartbeat. Wait till you hear this heartbeat. And it was like, boom, boom. And, I, and then, like, you know, a year and a half later, you're getting a pacemaker put in. <laughs> That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Would you yeah. ever attribute it maybe to the fact that you, you know, you trained so much when you were younger, like that, you know, maybe just that, that there was some kind of a knock on effect from the full time training, say, when you were Brighton or something? Um, I don't know, because like as a young lad, like when I went to school in Trimna Castle, we were heavily involved in the GEA club and the GEA uh, in the school. We, we got to an All Ireland final in secondary school, so we would have been playing, training every day, soccer, and then we used to train on a Friday night with Home Farm. I used to play for Crumlin GEA on a Saturday, and I used to play for Home Farm on a Sunday. Hmm. That's when I was in school. So, hmm. like when I went when I went over to England and we were doing pre-season, they put all the goalkeepers together, and like I could run, you know, compared to the other lads. And they'd be shouting, you, slow down, slow down. It was like, don't look, make us look bad, this type of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I always enjoyed running and I obviously enjoyed fitness, but I never struggled. It just, it, it seemed to just come on so quickly. Right. So you and then. No idea. Then. Yeah. 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 Um, well, like, he, he, yeah, go on. Sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, like, you know, when I went in to see the specialist, he put a monitor on me and all and, and, uh, I went back then with the monitor and he examined it and he said, uh, what did you do that day? And I said, oh, I was in work and all that. He says, all right. He says, your heartbeat never went above 29 beats a minute all day. So he brought me in the next day and put the pacemaker in before something happened. As, as I say, oh. yeah, very, very lucky to catch it. Yes. Um, yeah. You also won a number of caps for your country. You played at yes. all levels, I think, from under 15 up to the under 21s. That yeah. must have been uh, a great honour for you and your family. Absolutely. Brilliant times. As I said, I met Barry O'Connor and that. We, we had a photograph there. Um, I know Roy Keane put up a photograph of him himself and Paul McCarthy yes. in Turner's Cross in the Reuters jerseys. Well, I think we all played in that game. That was, I'm nearly sure that was a qualifier against Northern Ireland to go to Bilbao uh, under 16 championships. Yes. Uh, Joe McGrath was the manager. and 
I think we were, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I thought we were the first underage team to qualify for a European Championship at the time. And we went over and we played Portugal in the first game, drew nil all. We were 2 nil up against Switzerland and ended up drawing the game 2 all. And then we drew against Belgium in the last game. And unfortunately, Portugal went through on goals. Um, and they got to the final, I think, as well. But it, it was a brilliant experience. But you don't know you're living, Barty. You're, like, you're 15, 16 years of age, traveling all over the place, like going out to Hungary for European championships. You're going over, you're playing Spain. We played England, played against a very good English team. Um, I think actually Cole and all, or not actually Cole, um, Cole played for, England, for Man United. Um, Andrew oh, Cole, uh, Andy, Cole Andy, yeah. or Andy. Yeah, I think he bent one in the top corner past me in Daly Mount. But it was a great time because we were traveling with the senior team uh, at the time. Jack Tartan obviously was in charge. Um, Morris Setters was his assistant. Uh, he used to take care of the under 21 team. So it, it was great times. We'd play on the Tuesday before the international game and then go to the senior game then the next night. So it was, there were great times. You know, I was watching the Jack Charlton documentary. You know, we were there. <laughs> yeah, you lived it. And, of course, it was, a great yeah. time for, it was a great time to be involved in the international scene because of, you know, the, the excitement and the glamour as such that, that came with qualifying for, for the World Cup and the European Championships and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, like, Jack was very nice to me. I was very lucky. Um he, he, I was in the, I was in the under twenty one team, and then he had a B squad. Then and he brought me into the B squad as well. And I was I was on the bench. I think Gary Kelly and Jerry Payton were the two goalkeepers. It was, it was played in Talca Park, yeah. and then he, he, I remember him saying to me after me, "If you can come out training with us, come out and train with us." I said, "Well, yeah, I, I can do that." And they were playing. The senior team were playing against Wales in in the RDS the following week or two weeks time. Yeah. And he said, come out and train with us. So we trained in Clonshock on the Monday and then trained with the full, the senior team on the Tuesday in the RDS and all. And he made me so welcome. And he was always full of, you know, advice and all that type of stuff and talked away. And he knew Tony O'Neill as well at UCD. So there was always a link up there as well. But uh, yeah, no, he, he was very nice to me. Fantastic times for you. Yeah. Nice. Fantastic times. Yeah. Stage, I would say. Pardon? Nice memories to have at this stage. Well, yeah, like as I said to Suzanne, I, I watched I watched the Jack Charlton documentary and I was I don't know, I was afraid of what I was gonna see, you know, because he, he was a great man, he had a great stature in, in the dressing room. We played a match out in Turkey under twenty one and we were getting beaten one nil at half time and Morris Setters was the manager, and of course, Morris is walking through the door and he's pulling off the tie, and the jacket's coming off, and he's ready and he's starting to have a go at you. And you shouldn't have, I threw the ball out to the left fullback, and he went to hit it long, and it got cut out. Anyway, they broke down the pitch and scored from it. So it was my fault. And as he's having a go at me, Morris Setters, Jack walks in, Morris, I look after this. You're doing well. Keep it going. Okay. And then for. 10 minutes, Jack explained exactly what he wanted you to do. And it was the first time, you know, in that setup when Jack came in, he just, he changed a few things around and we went down the second half and okay, we still lost the game, but we played an awful lot better. And I think people understood then what he was looking for. Yeah, You know, it wasn't just about knocking the ball in the hole. There was an awful lot more to pushing up and supporting your front men and getting up and pushing up from the back and things like that, that we, probably hadn't heard from from Morris Setters at the time. Um, so that was where, like, you know, he's a great presence in the dressing room as well, Jack. Really, you know. Who was probably the best manager that you played under in, in all your time? Well, let's well, see. Brian Kerr, his knowledge of the game is fantastic. He knows players up in... I remember we were traveling up and down the car to Limerick uh, for pre-season. We went down to Limerick University. Dave Mahidi had set up a whole training thing. And he was talking about players that were playing up on the reserve team in Derry and players in Finn Harps and the fellas down in Galway. He wouldn't, he just don't know, he knew, he knew loads of players. And his knowledge of the game, he knew, you know, about when you're going to play a team. Listen, if this fella comes on down the left wing, this is what he does and all that. So Brian, for, for his knowledge, was brilliant. And then you had Pat Dolan then, then took over and Pat then brought the training 
and the facilities and the footballs and the training gear to a new level in Pats that we hadn't seen. And uh, so people would have their, you know, doubts about Pat. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't, uh, he, he was involved in St. Pats, but from a coach and so people would have probably questioned and all that. But he was excellent, Pat was. And he treated the players really well. He gave them a hard time when he needed them, that type of stuff. But he brought a whole lot of professionalism uh, to the other side of it. Um, so, And then he brought in Dave Mahidi from Limerick University. And Dave then started breaking down the league. He started putting up on boards. And he said, like, the first six games, that's, what, 18 points. We need to have 12 points. And then when you add it all up, you have last year's time, the t- title was one with 72 points. Well, if, if we do all this, we have 77 points. So he started to break it down into smaller things. And at the time, St. Pat's, as far as I remember, had an unbelievable record of scoring goals in the last five to 10 minutes. And that was down to Dave's fitness as well. Dave used to drive all the way from Limerick. He'd do the training on a Tuesday night. Uh, we'd meet Sunday morning in the Phoenix Park. And he said, lads, listen. We're going to train for 35 minutes. That'll be the warm up and the warm down. You'll work hard in the 35 minutes and then you'll be home. And it was. But, the, but the, you know, so that's what I say about Pat. He just, he did bring it to another level for a League of Ireland club at the time. Um, But Brian, obviously, because of his experience and all that type of stuff, uh, winning things and all that. But like, I used to laugh at Brian. We have six footballs for training and he'd be training behind the shed in Inchy Car. And like they were all after getting pumped up, and they were basically like balloons, yeah, like this. And and the lads would be hitting a few balls at the goals, and he, and you hear Brian coming, stop hitting the balls off the wall, <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and, you, <laughs> and you'd be going, they're in bits, they're in bits, the fo- footballs are in bits, you know. So um, yeah, oh good. Billy Canan was a very quiet manager down in down in Limerick. Um, Charlie was, you know, organised and. You know, as I said to you, always include you in the back five. You felt like a unit. Charity was very good as well. Treated me very well, you know. So, yeah, they're all good. Martin Murray. Martin, fantastic player at Dundalk as well. Martin was very calm and he was very he was very cool about the job. Um, again, they won the league at Dundalk when, when, when I went there. He yeah. Was, yeah, he was very good. Very good. And um, on that Finn Harp side, you know, there, as you said, there were quite a lot of leaders on the pitch and all of that. Mm. Who would have been the best player that you would have considered at Harps at that time? Uh, I'm going well, to get we had that the... now because you're going to meet some of your former Harps players at some stage. And they're going to say, hey, why didn't you say me? <laughs> well, I was, I was, well, see, uh, Kevin McHugh was putting up his, his Finn Harps XI oh, and, yeah. uh, uh, and, he, and whoever gave it, and I was, I was tweeting to him, you know, I say, what about me, pal? You forgot about me. <laughs> and uh, well, Kevin, Kevin was on, like, obviously speaky up front, you know, great at holding the ball up, you know, knew where the goal was, so strong. He, he like, you know, he stood out to me. Mulligan, James, he was beside him. Like, you know, you had Gavin and, and Deco together, like, the, you know, the, yeah. they, they knew how to do it. Minow on the left fall. The Frenchman on the right, Pascal, sometimes yeah. didn't know what he was saying to me. I used to sit beside him in the dressing room and I didn't know what he was saying to me. And, you know, in midfield, like Tom Mullen to me, Tom Mullen was, it was an excellent player. Like, really was. Honest as the day is long. You know, then you had Fergal as well. He came in as well, done really well. Um, there was Cav then. And, like, Donald O'Brien, you know, I think Donald was a big loss to us at the time. Um, I, he was I way around the pitch. Yeah, I, I would still consider the fact that Donal left us in your second season, that that was one of the reasons for the, the decline because Don, Donal was a fantastic holding midfielder as well as being able to get forward and score goals. Um, yeah. You know, and I mean, like when, when, when he kind of went out, you lost that sort of maybe cohesion in the middle of the park a little bit. Yeah, well, like you, Donal was your man to sit. Fergal was pushing on, you know, Tom going down the wing, because that was a great, you know, between Tom and Pascal, you know, strong down the right-hand side, Minnow down the left-hand side. Gen- like, you know, it's like everything. Bar- I thought the pitch at times up in Finn Harps didn't suit because of the team that we were. Yeah. We we, we could play. We yeah. actually could play. We weren't, like, you know, and at times, like, yeah, the wind and the rain could affect you. Uh, like we used to go out for a warm up and we go, it's a lovely evening. 
And then as we're, as we're going down the steps, Dykes, you'd say, they're after turning on the wind machine. <laughs> <laughs> and the rain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But sure. we, went, we were down to play Sligo one night up there and the wind was so strong. The floodlights kept flashing off. We didn't even get out on the pitch. The floodlights yeah. kept going off with the wind. But um, yeah. And then you wouldn't get a better night if a uh, pre-season night up in Finn Harps was just as a great night, you know. Yeah, balmy night, Lovely yeah. even. <laughs> yeah, balmy night is right. That's great, Brian. Listen, Brian, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. It's actually been fantastic talking to you this evening. Uh, oh, it's I've been great. thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have indeed. That's great, Brian. And good luck to you, Bartley. I'll see you shortly.